Shidal, say hello to the camera. Sir.
is a well known personality in the field of environment uh, she began her career uh, early 1980s as a co researcher with anil agarwal an eminent and committed environmentalist who gave the country its environmental concern and the message she began her career in researching and co editing the state of india's environment reports with anil agarwal she wrote towards the green villages which advocated her participatory democracy as a key to sustainable development dr narayan has been actively engaged in seeking solutions to air pollution control she believes that the answers to the growing problem of population will be reinventing the growth model of the western world <coughs> so that we can leap from technology choices and find new ways of building wealth which will not cost us the earth in this context uh, she and her colleagues have advocated the introduction of compressed national uh, natural gas in delhi to reduce air pollution the successful implementation of cng in buses in the capital has led to a substantial reduction in the air contaminants and become model for the rest of the world as a member of environmental pollution authority and the national capital region she continues to monitor and implement implement strategies for reducing pollution in delhi and other cities across the country dr narayan's key achievement has been the interest of the country and the need of the water security using rain water harvesting to augment resources and pollution control to minimize the waste she believes that her biggest contribution would be to build strong and vibrant movement for water literacy in the country under her direction cac has analyzed bottled water and their carbonated beverages for pesticide residue content aim of this study was to understand the extent of contamination of the ground water and food systems and to use this research for the reform for the regulatory system The study led to the setting of the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Pesticides and Residues and its safety standards for the soft drinks, fruit juices, and other beverages. Uh, JPC gave its report in February 2004, endorsing the findings of CAC on pesticides in carbonated beverages and recommending the wide-ranging reforms in the food safety in the country. This work has helped in uh, building strong uh, public opinion and awareness in the country. against contamination of food and water uh, she has been actually honored with uh, doctor of science by cranfield university uk and also from uh, doctor of science honorary from the university of calcutta in india she has numerous publications in this uh, field in the field of uh, environment and uh, she is board of several committees like prime minister's council on climate change member of swedish development council member of commission of climate change and development sweden member of uh, national ganga river basin authority uh, we welcome dr narayan for being a guest lecturer in this going with all of you here that you have to understand this as a new kind of environment environmentalism this is an environmentalism of the very poor of this country <coughs> this is an environmentalism which is arguing that the poor live on the environment <coughs> the environment is their survival If the environment is degraded and local water resources dry up, and if the forest is cut, then poverty is exacerbated. So they understand the value of environment much more 
then all of us who are sitting here who get bottled water and you have no idea where that bottled water comes from. You have no idea where that plastic of that water is going to go to. In fact, the last thing that I am should be serving is bottled water. So the first thing you should be asking for in this classroom is to get dispensers and, and uh, things. This is the most evil thing in the country to do. <laughs> Sorry. Digress. <laughs> but there should be some practice <laughs> also as what do you do? <laughs> Surely this is not a very efficient way of water distribution. Even as a management school, you should understand this. Very, very poor cost effectiveness. Only one company is making money. Uh, so people are demanding change in terms of development. And they are teaching us in some senses. And that's the very important lesson that we have to learn. They are teaching us that people have to do more with less. It's a very difficult lesson. It's a difficult lesson because if I was to look at it, versus the environmentalism of the rich, the environmentalism of the rich, which is also our environmentalism, the middle class environmentalism, it grew in the Western societies after those societies had become rich. So in fact, what they were dealing with <coughs> was an effort to mitigate the adverse impacts of wealth creation. And it is in that that they were essentially dealing with how to handle the growing amount of waste that there is in, the, in those societies. And I often call those environmentalists saying you're just a waste manager's movement because all you do is to try and clean up after you create the mess. And their solutions, therefore, have been looking for more techno fixes, small solutions. And this, in some senses, has kept the entire world behind the problem. And today, that form of environmentalism is putting the entire world at risk. If you look today, emissions between 1990 to 2006, the CO2 emissions have actually increased in the industrialized world. They have not reduced. The only countries which have managed to reduce their emissions have been UK and Sweden and to some extent Luxembourg. So thank you very much for asking me to be here. Uh, Dr. Dalta did tell me that it's a, it's a group which has come from a wide ranging uh, group of industries and other private sectors. So, I thought what I would do is to focus on what is the most burning issue right now, which is uh, the whole question about in, uh, development versus environment. Because I'm sure many of you have a lot of questions about it, and I thought it would be a good time to, to talk about your concerns. Whereas I have fortunate, uh, uh, I, I'm fortunate enough to give the lecture, I'll first tell you what my perspective is. And then we can, we can take up all your questions. So the question that obviously is, uh, is it environment versus development or development versus development is my question. Because I think it's for too long this, this entire issue has been posed as an environment versus development. But for me the big issue is one kind of development versus another kind of development. And that both are really about development. So it's about time that we stop pitting it against growth versus environment, but really growth versus growth. And the question is, who's growth? What kind of growth? How inclusive is it? How sustainable is it? How affordable is it? And to me, that really is the big challenge that a number of controversies that are emerging in India are throwing up today. If you look at one of the biggest controversies that has happened in this last year was the Vedanta case. Now, is anyone here from Vedanta before I go on? <laughs> I mean, they are from the subsidiary companies I, I, of Vedanta. I, 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 I don't work against industry, but I have a lot of, so it's always good to know which side. Uh, the Vedanta case was a fascinating case for me, because here you have a very big corporation, one of the largest in the world. Uh, it's obviously in a business, which is very important. There is no doubt in my mind that we need aluminium, we need bauxite. I mean, I would be a fool if I thought that we could do without aluminum. Uh, on the other hand, there is also a huge number of people who are saying that there is a damage to ecology, 
because of uh, the plant. And that most importantly, the livelihoods of very poor people are, are going to be impacted. And there is something that is important for us to understand in this world that we come from, which is a world of very rational thinking, and that we cannot, what we call rational thinking. That what the people in, in Niyagiri are basically saying is, our God lives in that forest in the hill above. We can't understand it. I understand. We, we cannot comprehend how a God can live in a forest. And in any case, all our gods are movable gods. At the end of the day, if you have a development project coming up, you can move your God and take it somewhere else. I mean, gods don't live in places which cannot be moved for the sake of development. But there is clearly these two sides. Our side, which is saying development is important. We need bauxite mining. That hill is required because it is the most cost effective solution for the refinery that is being set up. It will be closest <coughs> to be able to bring the, mine, the bauxite from there. Um, on the other hand, very poor people who are saying, we are poor. We are very poor, but your development will only make us poorer. Your development will hit our livelihoods. Your development will destroy our forests, which will destroy our water systems, and that just is not acceptable. So there are these two sides, and it's time we in the country recognized it. And I'm saying this particularly because I do find that increasingly there is a sense, often in industry, that the other side really does not have a point of view. I'm seeing this currently in a case which is in this state. It's a fascinating case, and I would suggest Dr. Dutta to definitely take you all to this village. It's not very far from here. Go and see it, go and understand it. This is what the future of this country is going to talk about. It's a case where there is a cement plant coming up, set up by one of Gujarat's biggest industrialists called Nirma. Important location because there are limestone mines close by. Important location because it is right next to the sea. So it's an industrialist perfect siting of a plant. On the other hand, this plant is coming up on a water body. I'm sorry. Uh, this plant is coming up on a water body. And I visited the plant recently, and I don't know, these pictures are very poor here because you've got too much light. Can we get some of the light down? <coughs> I visited this about 15 years ago. Water body. This is the plant, cement plant coming up. This is the water body. If from the hill across you see this whole spread of the water body and the Nirma plant over there, walking at a place where some gunmen accosted me of the plant, but uh, walking into the plant area, you can actually see the check dams have been vandalized by the company. Now, this area was allocated to the company because. <coughs> The area is technically not a water body. It has been, it has been, it, it shows up in government reports as revenue land. And it shows up as revenue land because about 10 years ago, this government itself, the state of Gujarat, decided on something which is very intelligent. It said that it had a huge problem of saline ingress happening along the coast. It had these amazing, it had a number of freshwater streams that were entering the ocean. And that what it would do is to tap the streams close to where they were flowing into the ocean, create bandharas or reservoirs, link the reservoirs one to the other, which would create irrigation for the people and would create a barrier for salt water ingress to take place. Now this area, when I went there, was very clearly an extremely prosperous agricultural area. And what the farmers there are saying is that that plant, which will come up in their water body, which will destroy the water body because it is not an engineering solution in which you can take away the catchment of a water body. You have to have a catchment to any water body. So the farmers are there saying, over our dead body, will we give you this land? This matter has now reached the Supreme Court. It's a very highly contested issue, but I want to pitch it to you as an issue where we, you will see more and more what I'm calling the pollution mutinies of this country. A billion pollution mutinies. So whether it is 
Nirma, or if any one of you are based in Andhra Pradesh, you would have read recently about another very major thermal power project coming up called Sompeta, where again the same issue was raised by people saying that here was our water body which was taken away for the thermal power project. That you did do an environmental impact assessment at a time when the water body did not have water and you said that it was barren land. In the case of Nirma, the environmental impact assessment actually says that the plant will be situated on barren land. It does not even talk about the presence of water. So what you're doing is both you're fitting water against industry, where I believe there is absolutely no choice. You will have to side on behalf of water. And two, you're pitting the poor people of this country <coughs> against rich industrialists, which I think is again something that we should stop doing. We have to find better policies, because otherwise I cannot see how a million, how a number, a thousand strong farmers can be, their anger can be quelled or, or, or shut up by, uh, by one industry. It will not happen. And more and more you will get more and more contested decisions, more and more decisions on which very poor people will argue that it is not good for their development, not good for their livelihood, their land has been taken away, their water has been taken away, their livelihoods have been taken away. In the case of Chhattisgarh, again, we have this amazing issue where you have a huge development rush. If you look at the number of projects that have been cleared in that one state between 2007 and the projects on the pipeline, you will see that there is a massive number of projects that are being cleared, particularly thermal power projects. Obviously, the state is very rich in, in coal resources. It makes, again, very eminent sense to locate thermal power projects at the pithead. There is no question about it. But the fact is that these are lands where there are forests, where there are poor people who depend on the forest for their survival. These are lands where the forests provide the water, which if you cut down the forest or you de devastate the forest, you will find you will have more in water scarcity. So you have a huge issue there. And you have an issue which I want to raise that you are you're creating, you're doing development without the regulatory ability to be able to assess the damage or to be able to monitor the impact of the damage of compliance. In the case of Chhattisgarh, the biggest issue that is emerging is that you have cumulative impacts of the projects that are coming up. You're no longer talking about one thermal power project whose environmental impact has to be assessed. You're talking about the cumulative impact of building a huge number, a huge capacity in a small area. What will be the impact of that? And you don't have the regulatory capacity to be able to assess the impact, and you certainly do not have the regulatory uh, abilities to be able to ensure compliance. If you look, this is the same thing of Chhattisgarh, and I don't have the map, but I hope you people will take the trouble to see our book called uh, On Mining. Uh, we've done a very detailed book on mining called uh, Rich Lands, Poor People. Is sustainable mining possible? We've looked at the entire scenario of mining and environment. And one of the most interesting things that comes out is that if, if you take this map of Chhattisgarh and you think about it as the map of India, you will find that the poorest districts of India are where the richest resources of India are found. Those are the resources, those are the districts where there are forests of India, those are the districts where there is water of India, those are the districts where there, the tigers of India live. Some years ago, the Prime Minister asked me to do a report on Sariska, on tigers, because after the last tiger was found in Sariska, and he was very worried, and he said, can you give me a report on what would happen with tiger conservation? And so the first time I understood, I mapped where the tigers of India were found, where the forests of India was, and where the poor people of India lived. I was a complete match. And when I presented the report to the Prime Minister, I said, the only thing I can think of is, if your poor people, can, if your people continue to be poor, living in those areas where there are very rich biodiversity wealth of tigers, then we will never be able to protect our tigers. That we need ways of sharing revenues with those poor 
for people of conservation, whether it is from tourism. And the same issue comes out in the case of mining and industrial development. You have the biggest indictment of development today is that the richest areas in terms of minerals are where the poorest people of India live. Bellari, I don't know if any one of you has been to Bellari, but Bellari is the most interesting case. It is, it has the highest number of registered private aircrafts mm. in this country. Right. Okay? And it is the lowest of the human development index of the rich state of Karnataka. Simplistic, yet effective to understand what we are doing in the name of development. Same issue is turning up in the case of the Himalayas. We have a major challenge here of hydroelectric plants. This is Arunachal. The one up there is a small graph that we did of the Ganga. You basically, if you look at Arunachal today, Arunachal has identified and is in the process of auctioning out sites that would equal to about 54,000 megawatts of power, hydroelectric power. Now you know India's installed capacity today. Okay? We're talking about one third of current installed capacity of this country coming out of that one state of Arunachal. No question again that water is Arunachal's biggest wealth. No question again that hydroelectricity is the cleanest source of energy and the cheapest source of energy. No question again that we need hydroelectric development. But can we allow this kind of madness to happen? Where the government allocates every stream, leaves it in a way that the stream actually has no water? Can you visualize the situation? To me, every river is Ganga, okay? But for, for one moment, can you visualize the situation which would have happened if all the five dams on uh, Alaknanda were built, our Bhagirathi were built, at that time, there would have been no water in the river Ganga. I have met women from those villages who have told me, have told government officials in front of me saying, please leave just so much water that we can at least have a bath. Clearly this cannot be called development. So this really is the kind of madness that we are doing today. We do not understand the cumulative impacts. And so it is this that is leading to what I call the million pollution mutants. The poor are telling us, they're telling all of us, I've been to Kaliganagar, I did go and see uh, the steel plant that the Tatars were trying to build over there. I've been across to understand why is it that there is so much anger. Because there is a general perception that there is anger because people are either misguided, people are being told to oppose projects for some reason or the other, people are naxalites, or if most of you are in industry and private sector, most private sector companies believe that their competitors are paying the industrialists to oppose the project. That's a standard sort of paranoia that I have understood. Probably it's right in your world. I'm not in the industry, I'm not in private sector. I'm sure there are dirty games played in industry. There is no question. But you have to also understand that there is a genuine anger of people there. And the anger of people is coming literally from them saying that they are poor. But our development will really make them poor. And the reason is very simple. When we have looked at project after project after project, what becomes very clear today is that modern development is intensive on resources. It takes away resources natural resources, whether it is minerals, whether it is water, whether it is forests, but it is extremely poor on providing employment at the place where the resources are extracted. There is no question that cement industry will provide employment, but it will not provide it in a factory today. <coughs> Any one of you knows that in a cement factory today or in a modern aluminium factory or a modern factory which makes iron and steel, today you, have, you are becoming more and more mechanized. You are becoming less and less labor intensive. So you are no longer in the situation where you can employ large numbers of people. You do not even employ people in mining today. I have been to the best of mining places in India 
and most of them are so highly mechanized that the only time that they require a human being is to transport the mineral from one place to another. So it's loaders, even loaders are very rarely required, it's really just transporters. And that is becoming a really important issue for us to understand that there is a dilemma here that that development which takes resources is not providing local livelihoods. So it can take and destroy, but it cannot replace. Now if you could actually promise all the farmers in Irma that I am taking away your water body, it will mean that you will not have agriculture. But all you thousands of farmers here who were getting water from this water body, my cement company will employ each one of you. Then you can still talk about a deal in which that development equals to another kind of development. But if that development that you are promising and I am promising and all of us are promising actually means that it is development but it is not local development and it does not compensate or replace the livelihoods. Because at most, and I have, we have studied in our report, you should take a look at it, we have studied all the schemes that the governments are coming up with. There are some good uh, governments which are coming up with better rehabilitation schemes, there are better industries which are coming up with better <coughs> profit sharing schemes, very few but a few that are coming up with them. There is now of course the bill in the GOM today which is talking about 26% sharing with uh, people of local, in the mining cases. You are beginning to see, but what you have, we have to understand is, people are essentially saying to us is that, yes we can get the money, but it does not replace our life. And we are not trained in the modern world to be able to survive in this world. So we are poor. We are not as rich as you are. Our, our son will definitely go to the city to work. But this land gives us that security. That gives us some livelihood security, which we cannot do. And it is this that is becoming a very important issue. I mean, I went to Goa and I was looking at the mining in Goa. And it's fascinating to see the number of villages I went to where there were blockades set up by the villagers saying, we will not allow mining companies to enter our land. Why? Because in Goa, as most of you know, mining happens across the hills. And people live across those hills as well. So all the waste of the mining companies are is accumulated in the uh, mine. Every time it rains, it comes right down into the fields, destroys water bodies, destroys streams. And so basically people are extremely angry. And that is an issue that we have to start understanding. In fact, we put together this when we did our mining book. And we were just amazed to see the number of protests that were happening across India, just from what we call development. And this, please remember, is not middle class environment. I am not involved with these protests, nor is anyone <coughs> like me. These are protests of extremely poor people who are essentially today asking that our environment means our survival. <coughs> we live on our environment. And this, uh, I do have that map. So this is really what I call the new geography of India, rich lands and poor people where you have the forests of India in the first map, that's where the forests are. <coughs> and you will see those forests of India are all, are all on the mineral resources of India. The water resources of India are also on the mineral resources. <coughs> Most interestingly is the third. These are the country's poorest districts. 150 poorest districts of India are superimposed and they completely match the areas where there is rich forest, rich water and rich minerals. And this is where the maxillism, the fourth is where the maxillism of India is grown. <coughs> You're beginning to see an extremely different, as I said, a new cartography emerge. And this is not good for this country. We have to find a different pathway for growth. I have therefore been calling this more and more, and arguing with government, arguing to actually reduce their emissions. And I'm talking about here greenhouse gas emissions and we know very clearly that CO2 emissions are intrinsically linked to the way society creates
creates wealth. They are related to economic growth today. So let us be very clear that that form of environmentalism, which is looked for efficiency without controlling or talking about the need for sufficiency, which has really looked at what are the technical solutions to a lifestyle choice issue, which have looked for answers which create very expensive solutions in some senses and further iniquity. That is the solutions that we are trying to adopt in our world. And that is putting the entire world at risk. If you look at this, just one country, the United States, 28% of the cumulative emissions, and I'm not even talking about from industrial revolution, just from 1950 onwards, 28% of the cumulative emissions come from one country. Now this one country has less than 5% of the world's population. <coughs> just remember that. That's the scale of the environmental fallout that that growth model will require the world to have. That is important to understand. Because China till 2000 had consumed only 9%. But China we know is growing today and at really high speeds. China has 20% of the world's population. So if US for just 5% of the world's population require 28%, and, and very large amounts per capita, on a per capita, capita basis, there are 20 tons of CO2 emissions per person per year. Europe is about 10 tons. India is about a ton and a half. China is about 6 tons today. Now that's the growth model that the Western world has adopted that is today putting the world at risk. <coughs> And let us be very clear today that climate change is a reality. We cannot say that it's happening today. I cannot tell you that one weather event is because of climate change, but we are beginning to see a huge intensification of extreme weather events. Whether it has been the fires in Russia, which have seriously jeopardized the wheat crop and therefore led to a spike in food crops, this food price this year, whether it's the flood, simultaneous floods in Australia, in Sri Lanka, in Brazil right now, whether it's been the frost in very many parts of this country, whether it's been unseasonal uh, weather, extreme weather across North America. What scientists are saying is that climate change is science will come through those extreme weather events. And we are beginning to see it. And so it is important for, un for us to understand not I'm not talking about climate change here. I'm talking about the growth model. And more importantly, I am talking about the form of environmentalism, which is looking for techno fixes to a growth model, which is completely out of control. And it is this that I believe the environmentalists of this country, the environmentalism of the poor, is challenging today. So the question that I have is, that can we think about growth without pollution? Can we rethink the role of agriculture to create new <coughs> economies? Can we rethink the role of forests, for instance, to build new livelihoods? Economies that we have neglected for so long, parts of the economies that we have neglected for so long in our obsession with <coughs> the one kind of development that we call growth. Can we rethink those economies to create wealth? Perhaps not the Ambani type wealth, okay? But a man who spends 75 lakhs on his electricity bill a month cannot be called sensible. So as far as I'm concerned, I know he is the icon of uh, places like I am, but as far as I'm concerned, any man who spends 75 lakhs a month on electricity bills in his house, in today's energy scarce world, cannot be the icon of modern India. And if he is, then all of us are extremely foolish people. And the institutions who teach us that he is are even more foolish. So we need to rethink technologies for water and energy to build decentralized growth. Again, a huge area where we have been 
neglected in this country. And we need to rethink indicators of how to measure that. Because again, we have been so obsessed by what we believe is this growth-led, consumption-led model, growth model, that we have never really looked at other indicators that will measure well-being and not well. President Sarkozy of, um, um, set up a very interesting commission, which I think all of you should take a look at, the report by Stiglitz and Amartya Sen a few years ago. Very interesting commission to try and see, can you come up with a new measure as an indicator for well-being in the world. And I think that's a dis unfortunately the recession got over and that President Sarkozy didn't have an interest in following it up, but I think those issues will come back. It's a very important issue for us to do. It's an incomplete agenda. Let me in that context give you an experience that we have had in Delhi. I come from Delhi, I live in Delhi, I of course work across the country, but I do live in Delhi. And I do believe it's important to make some change in the city you live in. So some years ago, um, we got up in Delhi in the 90s and suddenly realized the pollution was enormous. We were fighting um, <coughs> horrendous pollution. We did this study at that stage in the mid 90s. And we said one person dies every hour in Delhi because of air pollution. We, Naresh Trehan, who's India's top cardiologist, said this mid 90s in Delhi, he said, if I cut up somebody, and even if the person is not a smoker, that's what their lungs look like in Delhi, black spots. And he gave us this other picture, which is of Himachal at that stage. So I've been to Shivla recently, and I'm not very clear if Shivla will have those kind of lungs anymore. But, uh, he gave us those lungs from Shivla, and he said, you know, if I cut them up, that's turned upside down, but the lungs are pink. This is from Naresh the 90s. It was an interesting learning for us. We put out, we started a campaign at that stage. We said, we put out this ad um, and said, roll down the window of your car, Mr. Prime Minister. The security threat is not the gun, it is the air of Delhi. And we gave the Prime Minister's home phone number and home fax number, and we asked people to call up and scream. He did. He said, a lot of people did. started calling from 5 in the morning. I started getting calls directly from PMO saying, we can't handle this. Please, please tell CSE they will have to find solutions. But we gave him an agenda. Our agenda was the introduction of compressed natural gas. We said, get up, get rid of diesel. Uh, certainly get rid of the differential between petrol and diesel because diesel is toxic. You're pushing private automobiles onto diesel. It's a subsidy for private automobiles. It's a killing solution. So it's bad for the economy. It's bad for oil companies. And it's very bad, unacceptable solution. So we gave those solutions and we sent it. Of course, the big reason why we were pushing, and that's the logic I want to explain, is that we were essentially arguing that Delhi needed to take a leapfrog step. We said we did not have the time to do what the rest of the world had done, which is to go from pre Euro 1. Now, just to give you people a sense of the proportion, Delhi in 1996, when we started our campaign, had 10,000 parts per million of sulfur in its. 10,000 ppm. That was pre Euro 1 when we began. And Europe already at that stage was on Euro 3 or going towards Euro 3, which was 350 ppm. Now, what we argued is that it had taken Europe 20 years to reach where we, it had reached. And there were incremental solutions because even every time as Europe moved from one technology to another technology and made the investment, it essentially found that the problem of pollution just kept increasing and moving. So just to give you a very quick snapshot of it, in the 80s, the basic pollutant in air, in, in air was SPM. I'm sure all of you have heard of it. Suspended particulate matter. That's what everybody wanted about. That's what everybody counted. That's what everybody designed its policies for. And yet, as you started controlling SPM, and you brought in better technology, which you did. You increased the, the, the uh, you brought in better technologies in vehicles. You brought in better fuel. You brought in fuel which had much less diesel in it. You brought it down to 500 ppm. That was the experience. Science also evolved. And science said, but sorry, we have not, you know, SPM was a problem of yesterday. Actually, the problem is RSPM. Res Respirable suspended particulate matter, PM10. And essentially what they found was that as technology had improved, the mass, the 
number of emissions, the, the, the mass of emissions had gone down, but the size of the particulates had also gone down. So now the particulates were even more deadly because God never designed the human body for diesel. Never. I don't know if God ever thought about diesel when he was thinking about the human body. Because the human body is designed with hair in its nose. And the hair in our nose keeps out big particles of dust. And the fact is, diesel particles were so small, and there is more and more evidence that they are noxious as well, they're toxic as well. So you were getting a situation where you were moving from dealing with one technology, improving it, thinking you had fixed the problem, <coughs> but getting into another problem of ours. Now that is not the end of the pollution story. As, so as vehicle, as emission standards become clear tougher, vehicle manufacturers improved technology, fuel also improved. You went down to 30 parts, 50 parts per million of, uh, of sulfur in your diesel and petrol. And even as you went down to that, you basically got up and said, but that's not the problem. The problem is even smaller particulates now, PM 2.5. So now, you started innovating even further, investing even further. And today, science is saying there are two major problems that vehicle manufacturers have. One, there is a trade-off between particulates and NOx because of the temperature increases that you need for combustion. So as you reduce your particulates, your NOx levels go up. And as your NOx levels are going up, you're getting another pollution problem and today Germany is putting in denox catalyst in all its cars only to deal with that. And that is even the beginning. Because today scientists are saying that to get all that, the next generation of vehicles are bringing in ultra fine particulates that will go through the skin. So forget the nose. They will go through your skin. And they are even more toxic. And the bottom line is that the numbers of cars are increasing. So this is really what we were arguing then. We said don't take this incremental route. If you move to CNG, you will move immediately to Euro 4 and better fuel. So take a leapfrog. That was in early 2000 that we were doing. And today we are asking the same question in Delhi again and pushing very hard. We are saying you need another leapfrog because today you have to reinvent mobility. Transport related emissions are the key contributors to climate change that transport related emissions are the key contributors to local air pollution. I don't care about climate change. I care about my lungs. I care about my health. I care about my children's health. Transport related emissions are the key cause. And the world today is looking for small solutions. This is not working. If you look at this graph from UK, in fact, it's a fascinating thing. If you see the number of car, if you see the, how PM10 emissions, the bottom line, the yellow line, have got delayed from the cars, okay? Average new car fuel efficiency has also got delayed. But the problem has been that the average CO2 emissions, the red line, continues to go up. <coughs> and the reason it goes up is because the private car kilometers continue to go up. So people buy more, people drive more. So you can make each car more efficient. But the impact is negated if you bring in that many more cars onto the road or if you drive that much more because it is on the basis of per kilometer. Now this is really what is the challenge in my city and I think the city of Ahmedabad and every one of the cities you come from is which environmentalism are you going to follow? Are you going to follow the environmentalism of the rich which gets you to fix the backside of every car? <laughs> but doesn't deal with the issue of mobility or will you reinvent mobility and deal with pollution and deal with the issue of equity and affordability. Cars occupy 90% of the road space in our cities. But in India, cars have not replaced the bus, the bicycle or walking. Cars have only marginalized the bus. This is very important to understand. In the rich city of Delhi, 40 to 60% of Delhi still drives, still takes the bus to work, still walks to work. 13% of Delhi, according to the government's own latest survey, take the car. In this city of Ahmedabad, 10% take the car. Only 13%.
And so the question is, if we cycle today, we take the bus today because we are poor. Can we take the bus, can we bicycle because we are rich? And that's the leapfrog that we need to think about. <coughs> and there's a very practical issue here that I have for all of you. If only 10% of Delhi or 13% of Delhi takes a bus, takes a car today, do the maths. 26% of Delhi is already under roads and flyovers. We have built every flyover possible. We have built double-decker flyovers. We have built expressways in the middle of the city. For only 13%. So as a matter of equity, my question is, if everyone in Delhi takes a car, as they must, where will Delhi find the road space? 13% is leading to pollution and leading to pollution. <coughs> How does Delhi provide for 100%? And if it can't, then should it not think about reinventing mobility completely? So that everybody can buy the car. I have nothing against the car companies. You can buy the biggest, the most fuel inefficient cars. Because I understand that the status of a person is made by the length and the size of the car that they buy. <laughs> so you can buy the car, I've seen ads of car companies which tell their prospective son-in-laws are bought because of the size of the car. Those are ads on TV, so clearly there's a status issue there. You can buy your car, but keep it in the garage. Because you can easily take a bus. And the fact is you can only take that bus if it is convenient, if it is affordable, if it is modern. I am not talking about the Katara buses that we have on our roads today. I am talking about an ultron modern efficient system which is air conditioned, which is integrated, which is connected through a metro, a bus, a bicycle lane, a taxi, reinvent mobility. It will also give us jobs. Every time I say this, car companies and uh, big policy makers pounce on me and say, but you know, India is going to be the automobile hub of of the world. Cars are good for economy. Yes, but so are buses. Make buses. You know the number of buses we make in this country a year? Take a guess. Anyone from a car company here? How many buses do you make? Does India make? Buses uh, close to 6,000 a month. 30,000 a year. 30, How many cars? Cars, <laughs> we make 12,000 a month. How many cars? More than uh, 15, 16 years. Over a million. <laughs> okay, so I mean, what are we talking about? Surely we can reinvent this completely. I'm having the biggest trouble today because I fought for the fiscal incentive for buses in India. I got the cities the fiscal incentive in fighting to get buses delivered. And we don't have the capacity to deliver buses in this country. Has to me just cannot it cannot make economic sense if we cannot have high efficiency vehicles uh, moving. So again, it's a question of reinventing growth. It's still growth. I'm not against growth. <coughs> reinventing the concept of growth. So as I said, can we provide space for all to drive, whether in India or the world? Delhi, 10% drive past, 24%, 26% now percent of the city is under road. Speeds are down, not up. How do we provide for 90%? So the end, my question really is, it's not sufficiency, but really efficiency. That we, in this world, at least, there is no space for easy answers. You need car is it's oxy rich. Okay? In fact, I took up this matter. I'm on the committee of the BIS, which looks at these labeling of these bottles. And I took up this matter. I filed a formal complaint saying, this is scientifically a fraud. You can't do this. And yet Manik Chand is one of the most powerful industrialists apparently from this region. Thankfully he's not there in the part I can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and I was told, Jana to bikeki to bikeki. It's not so popular in Delhi area, but it's very popular. So one, two, how much water are you drinking in this? How much? 200 ml. How much water do you drink in a day? Three liters. Three liters. So how many such bottles will you require? Six. How many such bottles will require collection centers? If you had to fill this in one glass, how much water will come? Same. Same. Same? Okay. 
How much less disposable waste would you have over here? How much more? And I have a larger issue. I mean, we fought bottled water companies for two reasons. One, the fact that the source of the water, they never pay for bottled water. They never pay for water. So this company does not pay a penny for the water that they take, the raw water. And I've argued this with polars, I've argued this, I've gone very far, they're just so powerful, these guys. You take it to such an extent and yet they get somebody to agree that you know it shouldn't be done. The fact is, this is raw material. Now all of you are from industry, do you not pay for your raw material? Yes, we do. Okay, how come this company doesn't pay for raw material? It sells water. Coca-Cola sells 90% water, 10% sugar. It pays for 10% sugar. Why doesn't it pay for 90% of the water? It's raw material. For every six liter, for every one liter of cola and beverage that is made, you use six liters of water. Okay? Why is that not paid for? Simple market economics. Then the larger question is, is this the most efficient way to transport water? And to provide it, to a population which is highly, where water is such a desperate need. You have large numbers of people who die because they don't have clean water to drink. You have a country which should be ashamed of itself. I'm ashamed of my country for that reason, that the largest number of children who die in India die because of dirty water. In that scenario, is this the best way? That the rich and the elite of India can pay some ridiculous amount. How much do we pay for this? Five rupees? Five rupees for 200 millimeters milliliters of water. Okay. At home you don't even pay, I don't know which city you come from, but in my city we pay 5 rupees for a thousand liters of water. Yeah. And that's high. Bangalore is one of the highest rates at about 7 rupees. Okay. So there are larger issues. So the question that I have, I want labeling to be done. I want manufacturers yeah, to take responsibility. But I want that to be extended a little more. No, in fact, I would say that even mining, like per kilogram of iron ore, how much impact are you causing Good. for uh, environment? I mean, if we force people to think, I mean, Good. people could give some cooked up data, I understand. But if you can no. force people to set up and put in some data, I that agree. at least gives another person to give a chance to challenge it. I and agree. We have one of our most successful projects in the center is something called the Green Rating Project. We rate Indian industry in terms of its environmental impact. We do a full life cycle analysis <laughs> from the time when it sources its raw material to the final product. And it has been fascinating for me to see the conversation that we have with that industry. It's a, it's a project which is a public audit, but we have almost 100% participation at all times. And I see an enormous willingness also to understand how both you can improve efficiency and therefore how can you start accounting better. Because accounting is something that all industry also requires, smart accounting. So, but I, all I'm saying is we need to stretch it a little more. I'm kicking the bucket a little more. I'm rocking the boat a little more, even though my friend there doesn't like me rocking the boat so much. I'm <laughs> rocking the boat a little more saying, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't rock the boat, you won't have a boat at all. So rock it. It doesn't sound very nice. It doesn't sound very convenient. I can come here and give you a very sweet lecture. I can be very charming if I want to be. I can give you a very sweet lecture and go back. But it's not going to help. You have to rock the boat. And do take them to Nirma. Get them to understand that perspective. You just mentioned. Yeah. You just mentioned about lots of hands now. The subsidy. <coughs> you just mentioned the fertilizer subsidy goes to no. the industry, no. not to the fertilizer. How it is? I mean, no. this is. It basically it goes to the. It goes to the industry as a reimbursement. It doesn't go directly to the farmers. No, it's, it's I mean, what would be nice is to give that same money in the hands of farmers. No, but Why don't we give the farmers a coupon? to say, you can go and buy so much fertilizer at that rate. No, I, I understand it's also yeah, reducing yes. the cost of fertilizer. No, and again, But the again, fact is, why don't you give it to farmers? Again, government has, is lacking in infrastructure. Where they are not able to, to reimburse it directly to the farmers. Number two, in, government is also working on the same lines. They are trying to do, but I mean, this is a misconception that subsidy goes to the industry. Subsidy to ultimately industry. goes to the farmers through industry. It goes to industry. I mean, any subsidy which has gone up from 20,000 crores to 157,000 crores in a matter of just three years mm. is something that the industry should be. I, I haven't seen any other industry which has asked for such high escalation. See, I mean, we don't produce a single kg of potash in the country. 
we I mean import almost 80% of So why can't of we think of producing potassium shift? Simple. So why can't we think of producing potassium shift? There's a lot of potassium shift. I mean, that can be no, no, so there's a lot of shift in this world. No, but no. This so if the subsidy was not given to industry, again, if the subsidy was not given to industry and we had a limitation, we would start reinventing and saying, why can't we think differently? There's a lot of compostable material in our cities. Today, cities don't know where to put it. You take 157,000 crore is given to fertilizer industry in this country. Industry, I mean, given, be happy. The, given to the industry the, is not happy taking the subsidy. So all. wonderful. I, I hope somebody is listening to you. Yeah, absolutely. I hope somebody is listening to you is all I can say. Give it to cities. Let them take all the sewage and the compostable material, make fertilizer out of it, and give it to farmers. Okay? And don't give the cities the subsidy. Give the money to the farmers directly as, as they are now thinking. You are very right. There is now a talk about moving from fertilizer subsidy to stamps. You have already moved to micronutrient subsidy. I am aware of all that. I yeah. am just essentially saying to you, those are the models that we need to be invented. Then this 20,000 20, to 157,000 euros. This is again, I mean because of I mean different reasons. This is not because it is going to the industry. I think I take your word for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still ask for reinvention. No issues. Yeah. I just had a simple question. I, um, right from 15 years ago, the Sardar Sarovar project in Rohan and Mela Partner, and then now location has under the industries around. Um, what did, I mean, it's always a difference or conflict between the environmentalists and the government. So, what is the basic reason? Because both, you know, we always see that in you know, results in the huge rallies. And and so on and so forth. So what do you think, what is your perspective on why the government is rigid or, you know, ultimately uh, sanctioning locations of industries in the north is in the purview of the government. So where is the gap? No, I think there are two issues there. I think one clearly is an issue, as I mentioned, that you are seeing the fact that people are affected, and that's what people like Mirna and others are representing, affected. But there's another part to it as well. Your regulatory systems are very poor. I didn't talk about that. I could give you a full lecture. We just completed a very major study on the state of regulators in India. Because I think it's very important to have strengthened regulators <coughs> if you want to do this. Um, you do not have any citing regulations for industry today, which are really good citing regulations. Uh, you do not have clearance processes, which are very good. When I've looked recently, and I'm so full of this, because I'm really trying to get the Nirma issue is a very important issue for me takeover of a common water body. And when I looked at the EIA of the Nirma project, it's so poor. It's so fraudulent. It's completely unacceptable. And yet, because there is no ability in government to actually either assess the environmental impact assessment, you have to clear the project. And then people protest, and then you say, but I have to review the project. So you need a much more strengthened <coughs> regulatory ability. And the biggest problem I'm having today is that you can clear projects with a number of conditions, but you have no ability to monitor compliance of those conditions. Now, what is happening, and that's important for all of you in the private sector to understand, that they, I think there are some very good Indian industrialists who are trying very hard to break the mold and to do things differently and to do the right. But what is happening is that there are a large number of Indian industrialists who still feel that they can circumvent the system and get the clearances and do the projects in spite of everything and do not meet any conditions of compliance. As a result of it, public credibility is so low that next time somebody <coughs> comes to you and says, but you know, this public project is actually a clean project. It's not going to displace people and even if it is going to displace people, I'm going to rehabilitate everyone. People basically say that it was never done in the last project and government didn't care about getting it done in the last so I think the lack of credibility in the public institutions is really hurting the pace of industrial growth today. And the only way to repair it is to start respecting the integrity of public processes, which has never been done till now, or you know, has really been hurt till now. So I think that's important. I, let me just move quickly now. I have a few people in that, then I have a few people. Yeah, yeah. We talked about industrial pollution. Other well, than that, since industries are growing and uh, India is also developing, industry, industry also requires. At the same time, pollution is created. And there are central laws and uh, there are Supreme Court directives also. 
and uh, if industry decides, the pollution can be controlled. But because of this, uh, again you are saying about politics and uh, many of the industries are managing the pollution, but many of the industries are managing the government bodies on this thing. Mm. Then the pollution is created and we are planning to call them. So as an expert, environment expert, you must have given some uh, suggestions or some your valuable suggestions to the government, say, uh, central government. Uh, if you have, have you given some suggestions, and what is the status and whether government is going to take some action? We've definitely given a lot of suggestions, we are not only giving suggestions, we are pushing to get those done as well. Um, so we, we work very hard to get our recommendations implemented. Two levels. One, of course, we have been working with industry and some sectors of industry to see where are the leapfrog options. What are those technology options that can help you in terms of moving ahead much faster? That's one. The other is to try and improve, I believe the biggest issue today is to improve the monitoring abilities of this country. One of the reasons why industry you know, often finds that even if they are cleaning up, people don't believe it, is because there is no monitoring abilities in the system which can make sure that all data is put in the public domain. People know which industry is polluting, which industry is not polluting. So as a result of it, you are really creating, I think, a situation where even the honest industry is, which is, who is doing something and dealing with that issue is finding that there is a problem. But again, keeping the you know, I, I want to keep discussing the idea that I'm, I want to keep repeating it so that I leave you with that idea, is that I still think industry has to also think of also ways to reinvent. For instance, I'll tell you, we did a very detailed survey of the pulp and paper industry. As you know, pulp and paper industry is very high consumer of uh, water in particular. When we started our first rating, it was 200 tons of water for every ton of paper produced. Next rating we did in the mid uh, it was seven years later, it was much better. It was on an average, I'm, I'm taking all pulp paint, pulp paper, all the units together, it was 130. But the big thing was that you still, the pulp and paper industry still uses a lot of chlorine today uh, in its process. Now the argument that we made is that if you would eliminate chlorine in the process of manufacture, which is possible, as you know, one of the industries has done it in India, uh, if you do that, you will actually save on the waste treatment that you will have to do. So if you could have an agreement with government to say that I will eliminate chlorine in my process, but that means that I do not have to invest in such high order of waste treatment systems, I can give my water for reuse to agriculture. Because most paper industry is located in places where water is very scarce and there's a huge market. So that could make a very, very important trade-off. So again, again it means reinventing. Also means rethinking. I mean, one of the things I'm, I mean, I'm a victim of, and I am uh, part of, is this paper, white paper. <laughs> now, all of us have been trained to look at white paper, but it's bleached paper, okay? and it prints better. So all of us use it. Yet it's a lifestyle issue that if we didn't bleach the paper so much, we wouldn't need that kind of chemical load in our paper industry. So again, it's it, it's 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 all about you know trying to fix the processes. But again, I know I'm not against. I, as an environmentalist, I've never been against the paper industry. I still believe that it needs wood, but it should go to the farmers to grow its wood. It's a perfectly sensible solution. Let them grow your wood. You go and use it for making paper. You do value addition. Bamboo is, I'm fighting in this country, I hope I will succeed. I'm fighting very hard to get bamboo declared as a grass because it is declared, it is called a timber today because it is a timber, nobody can cut it and nobody can grow it. So I'm fighting very hard and I'm hoping in the next 10 days I will get some, some breakthrough on it and bamboo will be a grass so that people can grow it, people can cut it and people can learn from it. That would be the change of the economic growth model we could see livelihoods being grown. So instead of industry, but my fight is, we've had long fights with major paper industry in this country. Some agree with us, some still disagree with us, which is fine. But our fight has been, a paper in Indian paper industry wants large amount of land to grow its raw material. And we are saying you won't get the land, but you can go to the farmer to grow your raw material. So create a supply chain which is sustainable, which brings the products, which brings value down, rather than you growing the, uh, the forest. It's an issue on which Indian paper industry is divided halfway, okay? Some like us, some hate us. That's okay. I have now last one, Jai, that lady there, she's left. I think she had a question. Yes, you have. I want to share something. Yes. I am from Mahindra and Mahindra. Uh -huh. Where the company has been traditionally into manufacturing, that's also specific, specifically automobiles. And we have been creating pollution across 
by, by the economy has been doing. But more importantly, the thing which I want to bring to the, the group, uh, we have actually changed our uh, vision itself yes. from a manufacturing company to a company which wants to bring farm tech prosperity. It actually focuses on improving the lives of the farmer. First, the initial level of work which has been done is about water and soil conservation. And uh, while the soil testing is being done by so many institutes which are government recognized, but the report normally takes 45 days to 60 days, whereas you have speed, speed up that entire thing to less than a week with specific suggestions on how to improve the pH, basic or acidic, and specific suggestions on which nutrients to add up. Similarly, we have moved on to further consolidating that through consultancies through every uh, university professors, specifically on crops, and give them specific inputs on how to increase the yield by using certain specific methods. <coughs> Further to that, we have gone into water management, which is we have taken a step as a, at a corporate level, how we can actually, while we say that two-third of the earth consists of water, but uh, as you shared, uh, it is not really available for a common man. So we are going to very aggressively into that, and we are, we are very aligned to it that next 10 years, we'll take the farmer to a different level, rather from a manufacturing perspective, we are actually speaking about a farmer's prosperity perspective. Wonderful. No, very good. And I think that's really what all those initiatives are looking at. In fact, when Bharat Mohan was there before, meeting the St. Xavier's panel, he actually. Mr. Mahindra Mahindra. He told me. He told me. They attended him on whatever we are doing. No, no, he told me about it. Very good. I think that's where we need to go. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir.
big issue is what kind of development. And there also in terms of agriculture, we have never really looked at what kind of better model of agriculture can we have which is less water intensive. Okay? We are also, if you look at that region, it is today pumping out such high volumes of groundwater um, and is becoming more and more in, uh, deficient in its water resources. And that's one of the reasons why farmers are finding their cost of production is going up. So it's a, you know, I think it's important for us to start looking at also valuing, as I said, valuing agriculture and the livelihoods of agriculture. Fact is, food production will cost. You ask this question of growth. And food production will cost. If you look at the US, for instance, if you look today at how much places like the US, places like Europe, subsidize their agriculture, US has agribusiness, Europe has farmers, small numbers, but still farmers. But then look at the volume of subsidy that they give. If you take the Indian subsidies that they give in the name of agriculture, you will see it's basically fertilizer subsidy. But the fertilizer subsidy does not go to the farmer, it goes to the company, okay? Now, I think it's very important for us to understand that the food and the production of food is going to cost. I mean, one of the reasons why today there is a huge fear of what's happening in Egypt. There's a huge fear of what's going to happen across the Middle East. After all, remember, the riot started because of the growing cost of food. That was the beginning of the riot. And today also, the anger against Mubarak is partly because of the, the cost of food today going up. And therefore, people feeling very angry and very, I mean, it's pent up anger. There are many other reasons, but this is one trigger. And there is a very major issue in the world. How are we going to produce food in our part of the world where you have huge issues of having large areas under rain-fed agriculture, large areas where the cost of production is going to be higher. And yet, you have become so used to having very cheap production systems, subsidized production systems from the West, distorting the food markets across the world. These are issues which I think are going to be very important for India to resolve. Also, if you look at it, we have to start valuing that, that the value of that food and the value of that farm. And that, I think, is going to be a very important and a difficult proposition because we often don't see it. I mean, I am always amazed when I say sometimes this, and it seems too so logical for me, and sometimes I do get really angry about it as well. I can see the lack of comprehension on the other side, which is saying to me, but that's stupid. How can poor people, poor farmers or poor, what is obviously a big development project, because they are poor. But we don't seem to understand that, that they, they are not so poor, they, they have some uh, so Yes.
Madhya Pradesh is doing it, uh, Gujarat is doing it. Many times, mean, if you look at Sabarmati, is joined to Narmada. It's a river linking project. So, I mean, large parts of uh, Andhra, the south. Yeah, large parts of Andhra are actually very dry, bad. Pretty dry. So, when we're talking but about Andhra is very really far from uh, Brahmaputra, you know. So the idea was to take, see the only river which has got water really is that, that river there. Now if you want to take it, you have to take it across that chicken head. Okay, that, that little bit of chicken head that we have. It's all these times in spate at that time. Take it to Mahanadi, which is first Padma and uh, Ganga, which is already full of water and creating a mess. Then you have to take it to Mahanadi, okay, which is, uh, in the month of, uh, any one of you know Odisha, it suffers very badly because of the way we've managed our Manati system, okay? So you would say, so there is a genuine issue there. And I think it's about time that the people in the south understood that they built huge civilizations without having to depend on Brahma Okay? That they have their own culture of water management. And I think it's, it's been a very bad politics of the politicians there, which have said, tended to say, this is bad politics. Tamil Nadu gets two monsoons. Tamil Nadu does not respect the water that flows on its own lands. Tamil Nadu is making sure that all Karam Oak land around every tank in Tamil Nadu has been handed over so that the tanks have been destroyed. So you need to think a little bit. Water is an issue where I think we need some new thinking in this. <coughs> not get lost. I'm not against it. We were into anything. I'm not against dams. But you'll have to make sure that they're feasible. Yes, please. And then I have to. Yes. Uh, I'm kind of a bit disappointed. Uh, you have one slide which is proposing a, you know, what is your definition of development? What do we call re-engineering development? Yeah. Right. Uh, I am a citizen, I am an entrepreneur, I am a consumer, I consume agro products, yeah. I consume all the developed world agro uh, products as well, I am a polluter, I am the one who is suffering from the pollution as well. So from this presentation, what do you want me to take back? Because the data that you are throwing at me, I can pick it up from any of the white papers. Yeah. No, I don't think you will pick up this perspective from a white paper if you are listening to me. If you are not listening to me, then of course you can read any white paper and get away with it. I'm saying something very fundamentally different. So, I will answer your question, but be respectful of what I'm saying to you. I'm giving you a very different proposition of how you're going to look at development in this country in the future. You may not agree with it. You have the perfect right to disagree with it because this country is a democracy and I very much respect dissent. I respect my own dissent, I will respect your <coughs> dissent completely. Okay? But listen to me. Okay? I'm saying something quite different. I'm saying you will require a new form of development. And I am being humble enough to say that I don't know what that development is going to mean in the future. But I'm simply saying to you that that form of development that we have followed up to now is being insufficient in dealing with the world's problems, world's environmental problems. And that form of environmentalism that we have practiced to mitigate the problems of development have also been <coughs> insufficient for the world. Because if it hadn't been, then climate change would not have been a problem. So I'm saying to you that it is, I, I don't know what that form of development is going to mean, but I'm saying unless you can think about it, you don't know what the answers are. And every time I do think about it, I find answers. I think about it in the context of Delhi, for instance. I dealt with air pollution in the mid-90s. We also proposed solutions which were largely technical. We looked for backside of the car solutions. We looked for an alternative fuel solution. We looked back in Delhi in the mid 2000 and we sat back and said, oh, but the sheer numbers of cars are negating everything that we are doing. So we said we need to look for a different solution. When we looked for a different solution, today we have a blueprint of what that mobility pattern for Delhi will mean. We have fought and got the right to walk in Delhi. Do you have the right, right to walk in your city? Where do you come from? Bangalore. Hmm? Bangalore. You don't have the right to walk. <coughs> okay? But you don't need to probably. But certainly there are a lot of people in Bangalore who need the right to walk. And they don't have the right to walk because you're digging out every pavement. May I conclude? Huh? So, what I was uh, commenting on is probably, you know, instead of, you have, uh, there's a lot of knots. And what
what went wrong? Do you feel if you are able to highlight what are what we are proposing? What you give me proposing? a solution. I've given you one. You give me. Fair one. enough. I've given you one on mobility, redesign mobility for the city of Manchester. I can give you a blueprint right now. Which will get you to work faster, which will require a huge amount of investment in the city of Bangalore, so which will require a restructuring of your public bus uh, uh, service, which will have implications in the automobile car industry, which have implications in your uh, in your taxation systems, which will have implications in what you with what you consider good and what you consider bad. That's what economic growth is about. It's not some macroeconomic stuff that the planning commission. I'll give you a solution. You give me a solution. If you're a polluter, tell me how, what do we do. Bangalore has enough of all of those green uh, funders that they're coming out. Do you know your, your driving rates are actually going down? I, I, I monitor Bangalore. Okay? I'm a Supreme Court so, committee which monitors Bangalore. Honestly, Bangalore. sitting here, you're I don't know what this electricity is coming high. from. Whether it's coming from a thermal plant, whether it's the coal which is running. As a consumer, I think all of us, we don't know whether the electricity has been generated from eco-friendly or eco environmental polluting uh, perspective. What's an eco friendly source of generation? It could be LPG or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm a consumer. I'm talking as a consumer. So, you be an so what, I'm consumer? what I'm requesting is that. Should you be an informed consumer? But that's exactly what I'm asking you that. So, do you feel but that. I'm not even wanting to be informed. I mean, my point when I'm saying this, you're basically challenging and saying, oh, but you know, I've got this all, I've read it all. What's new in this? You're giving me a list of problems. You have no solution to offer. That's basically what you're saying. No, 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 let's finish this. I like this. I'm not, I'm not taking offense to this at all. I, I, I find this very interesting. This is a mindset which is important for me to understand. Like uh, the intent is, we hmm. want to carry some message from here. Hmm. In India, generally, we follow whenever there are tough laws to follow. Hmm. I was in Delhi then, uh, like the first resume of Sheila Dixit and uh, CNG hmm. taxis came into hmm. picture. Pollution went down, down drastically. Hmm. I'm from Delhi College of Industry. So, we generally like wait for good laws, strict That's laws. Right. So like the point which you are making here, we, we are aware. At the moment we are out from the class, we may be behaving very differently. Mm. Whether use of this plastic bottle, water or anything mm. else. We generate more waste, damage our environment. So like in a nutshell, what, what's the practical message you want to convey to us and how to move it? Good question. The practical message is that you have to rethink what you have been taught in terms of what is environmental management. Environmental management in now has been taught, as I keep saying, as fixing a problem as you create. Um, let me talk about the car companies. My biggest issue today with the car companies is we are increasing dieselization of our cars. Okay? We are increasing dieselization because we have got a high differential between petrol and diesel. We know that. We know the fact that diesel is kept largely for the agricultural sector or the public transport sector. <coughs> and yet data from the Planning Commission, the latest data shows us that 15% of the diesel consumed in this country today is consumed by private automobiles. 12% okay? is consumed in agriculture, according to Planning Commission's own data. You're increasing the differential between petrol and diesel. You basically push every one of us to buy a diesel car. You the under recovery today for an oil company on every liter of diesel is 8 rupees. So you end up being bad for the oil companies, it ends up being bad for the environment. Now what's the practical solution that we are pushing for in government? We are saying tax a big car, tax an SUV, tax a diesel car. It's not something that is very easy to do, it's not very easy for us to get done, but those are the practical solutions. I can't give you people, and I'm not here, to give you people 10 ways that you can save the world. I do not have those 10 ways. You can invite some film star to give you those. There are a lot of film stars who are environmentalists today. They'll be prettier, much more glamorous to come and give you a lecture on environment. Don't waste my time, okay? There are a lot of environmentalists. And I can give your professor a list of those film stars and many other such people, very glamorous people. They'll come and give you 10 ways to save the world. I don't have those 10 ways. You definitely have helped us in thinking in a different direction, different dimension. Like it's definitely not a dimension that we have thought in the last uh, three you. weeks. Uh, just extending further, like what <laughs> you made this point about this plastic uh, thing. I mean, just a thought, like what we have this 
extremely useful nutrition fact which says it is zero calories typically in all water. Just just water. Calories. Just. We have a system where we need to publish environmental facts as well. It may not be the right. Looked at it. I just cooked up because most bottles have it. But can we also have a system where we publish environmental facts, or we publish, we we can force manufacturers to publish environmental facts so that at least a responsible consumer can make a responsible decision? I no, I think it's a very good. But again, how far will you extend that publishing of environmental facts? Now let's get let's take this. It's a very emotive issue. Um, firstly. The very fact that it's promising you that there is oxygen in this water. <laughs> okay. You really, really need to be really very illiterate to, to think that there is oxygen, that this company is providing you oxygen in its water, and that it wasn't there. That's your, I mean, as a consumer, don't tell me any one of us are illiterate here. Don't tell me any of us don't know what we're talking about. Yet we're buying this bottle, saying it's zero calorie and it has oxygen. 